Hey, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today we're starting a new topic. Uh, it's called uh, the cults. Uh, we're going to uh, be discussing three different cults. Uh, and, and it's going to probably take, uh, I don't know how many, maybe five or ten or fifteen episodes of this to get through all this. So it's going to be quite a lengthy study. Uh, we're going to be discussing Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, and Roman Catholicism. Uh, we're going to begin with the Mormons. And um, before we do, uh, I want to introduce uh, those people on the panel right now. Uh, welcome Eve. This is Sister Eve Whalen. Her YouTube channel is Eve Whale, E-V-E-W-A-L-E, -E, so I hope you'll subscribe to her channel. Hello, sister. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Did you, by the way, did you notice anything? Look at this. Oh, did you get a new mic? Yeah, guess how I got it. How'd you get it? Our beloved sister Tanya sent it to me. Oh, awesome. Yeah, she she was tired of my audio being so such poor quality. She sent me this. <laughs> yeah, let's also introduce bro brother Mitch. This is Mitchell Belenkoff, and his awesome. YouTube channel is is uh, he's listed as his name, Mitchell Belenkoff. So, brother Mitch, thanks for joining us. Hello, hello. <laughs> Okay, well, let's start off first by uh, uh, trying to define. I, I have my idea. When I say the cults, uh, I think in, in the, in Indianapolis. When you say that, <laughs> uh, cults there. Wait, let me let me get less light on, on me in this room here. Hang on a second here. Okay. Probably looked better before, but it seemed like a lot of glare. Um, the, not, not the Indianapolis Colts or the Indiana Colts, I mean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However, there probably are some cults in Indiana and in Indianapolis. Um, but uh, the word cult a lot of times is thrown around. And uh, I, what, do you, how, what do you consider a cult? And then I'll tell you what I think uh, a cult is pertaining to this uh, topic we're on. Well, I'm wondering, is it, is it the short term form of cult, a cult, or is, you know what I mean, a cult? And, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that how do, you, how do you define something? I could call the Catholic Church a cult, you know? It, it, it's sort of like, um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a belief system that isn't right, as far as I know. Uh, but there are certain... I guess um, traits that that that, that uh, a cult follows, which by and large is the church in itself. Uh, you know, a lot of these people who are who are involved in a cult are controlled. It's almost like mind control by mm -hmm. the uh, by the doctrines of the cult. I mean, you think, look at Lordship Salvation. That seems like a cult to me because it controls the people, does it not? Yeah, yeah. I think that. Uh if you were to ask the general population what a cult is, the idea of some kind of mind control, a lot of people think like Jim Jones or that Branch Davidians uh, in, in Waco, Texas. These were little small groups of people and they were considered cults because they, the one leader has such control over these people. So control is something that is uh, commonly associated with the word cult. Um, but I, I'm going to, as I said, I want Eve to speak first and then I'm going to tell you how I'm defining cult for the purpose of the study. Eve, how do you see what a cult is? Well, <clears throat> I kind of agree with Mitch there. And to be honest, if you see it as something that is uh, controlling, I think it could also be found in even the Christian circles as well, which is sad. But um, I've seen people who are, you know, in, um, in the Christian circles who are also controlled by certain leaderships and stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the concept of uh, like mind control and, uh, uh, and then also uh, the idea of small groups. Most people think of a cult as being a small group of, of people, maybe 50 people, 100 people, a few hundred people in this little cult, you know. But um, I'm, the way I'm using the word cult is uh, Buddhism is not a cult because it does not 
profess to be Christian in any way. Hinduism is not a cult. It's not professing to be Christian in any way. Um, but Mormonism is associated as a type of Christianity. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses is kind of a type of Christianity. And Roman Catholicism, certainly a lot of people think it's the largest group of Christians are the Roman Catholics. Uh, so I think, to, to, for me, the way I'm using the word cult is something that is um, an imposter that uh, is not Christ, biblically Christian, but is normally thought to be a Christian sect. Um, and then uh, the second part of it is that they are horribly wrong in their belief system about what Christianity is. So we're going to be going through uh, this, uh, beginning with Mormons, looking at exactly what Mormons believe, and then we're going to compare it to what the scriptures say. Many years ago, I decided to study this out, and I took a lot of, quite a long time to uh, compile this book I put together here. Let me see. Uh, can you read that? Bible doctrine compared to the false teachings of Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Catholics. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the teachings of those cults to what the Bible actually says. Uh, and I've, you don't have to know really anything about these cults to participate on the panel or anything because uh, what I've done is I, I've collected the teachings from these organizations and what we're going to do is pull right from their own writings what they believe uh, so that we know we're, we're not making up something about them. And then we're going to discuss, well, what does the Bible say about that? Is this, is this correct according to the Bible, or is it different than the Bible? Uh, so that's the process we'll be going through. And as I said, uh, I expect this whole thing to be quite a few episodes before we work our way through all of this. Uh, but first, uh, let me ask you guys, uh, um, are you very familiar with Mormonism and Mormons? Have you had much interaction with them? Not so much. Um, I've had them come to my house and, uh, and uh, you know, try witnessing to me. And basically, they, they said, well, do you believe that all, there will always be a prophet? And, uh, and I am said, well, well what, what, the, what the prophets and the prophecies were talking about was the coming of the Messiah. So if the prophets had, um, had been talking about the coming of the Messiah and the Messiah already came, what need is there for a new prophet? Of course, they were baffled at this. So, uh, and, and that's the only really interaction. I they come to the house once in a while, and uh, but uh, yes, I, I have had some interaction with them. Not not as much as I, I, I should. I've studied other cults, uh, but mainly, usually, when I come in contact with people with, who give me their ideas, I usually am able to um, listen to them and, and then hear something that's uh, something that they've added due to uh, some idea that they have and then I'm sort of able to say well the scripture doesn't say that so that's mm -hmm. the only really with the Mormons that's the only real um, interaction I've had uh, with them mm -hmm. okay uh, how about you Eve are you familiar with Mormonism very much you know any Mormons have you had any interactions um, with them well I, I know a little bit about Mormonism I, I haven't had a lot of interaction with an actual Mormon um, but I just kind of wanted to say with Mitch, what you were talking about, there's actually a scripture that's, that talks about the prophets ending, uh, well, it alludes to the prophets ending up to John. Uh, so I'll find that for you and post it if you want to use it. on. Well, it, it, it did say Mormon where, where there are prophecies, they will end. Uh, but, but basically the message... No, not oh. that one. There, there's another one. Um, okay. okay. I'll show it to you. All right. But yeah, I haven't had a lot of interaction with them. I've had a, uh, a little bit of interaction with JWs. I do know a little bit about the Mormon teaching. Uh, I do know that they think that um, the brother, uh, Satan, is Sa uh, Jesus' brother, and um, that there are many gods that we will end up being a god, thing things like that. Something about um, uh, heaven basically kind of being on another planet, um, those are things that I've heard about Mormonism. Okay, uh, those things are actually what Mormons do believe, among many other things that are kind of most people when they learn these things, they'll think it's very strange and different. 
uh, and uh, certainly you won't find it in the scriptures of the, 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 the Bible, which is, is our source of truth. Um, but Mormons, I've had, um, growing up in Las Vegas, more, Las Vegas was originally settled by Mormons. So there's a lot of Mormons that live in Las Vegas. And I, I've uh, had personal friends throughout my life who are Mormons. Uh, and, and, that, and then over the years, I've also had many times Mormons knocked on the door. And it used to be I would just shut, you know, send them away before I got saved. After I got saved, I tried witnessing to them. And it got to the point where I think they kind of just told their headquarters, don't send anybody to that house anymore. <laughs> because uh, uh, we were showing their their air so so well that uh, I think that some of them might have even we might have created doubt in their minds and instead of them converting us we never did really convert a Mormon but uh, I know that uh, they they are easily just their belief system is easily disproven uh, but what I'm going to recommend uh, is what we're going to be doing here primarily is looking at their teachings and looking at this comparing it to the scriptures but before we get into that, I want to recommend that anybody who's watching this video, if you go to my uh, YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, I have a lot of playlists on all kinds of uh, theological topics, and one of the playlists is titled Mormonism Debunked. And, and I, I, I have uh, probably like 20 different videos of there, but the first five or six of them are, are really the most important I think if a Mormon were, was to go to those and look at those videos uh, I don't know see how a Mormon could possibly continue being a Mormon because the first video is done by an organization of former Mormons and they made this video called uh, uh, Book of Mormon versus the Bible and they showed that the Book of Mormon uh, is historically completely wrong. They proved archaeologically that the Book of Mormon uh, has no validity at all. It's completely fictitious. It's, and, and, and then they, and they made also um, uh, another video called uh, Mormons and DNA. And they proved through DNA that the story of, of the Book of Mormon is p impossible because the DNA line of people who live in the area they say that was settled uh, are, uh, is a totally different group of people that are originally from Mongolia, not from Israel. So, uh, scientifically, archaeologically, historically, geneal genealogically, all these ways, it's very easy to prove that the Book of Mormon is simply a fabricated book of fiction. Uh, and then I also have some videos of testimonials of people who were Mormons and worked their way up to become really highly ranked Mormons in their hierarchy who left and they tell why. So if, if you're a Mormon watching now, uh, you're, what you're going to get from this is primarily showing you that uh, the teachings of Mormonism are, are, do not conform to the Bible at all. They're completely wrong according to the Bible. Uh, but I, I think that the main reason people get into Mormonism and the main reason they stay in Mormonism has nothing to do with God or theology. What do you think I have in mind, uh, even Mitch? What do you think I'm, I'm suspecting is the main reason people get into Mormonism and stay in Mormonism? Well, first of all, it's, it, it generates an awful lot of money. <laughs> Um, uh, um, I mean, it, uh, not that, that money should be a motive here and there, uh, but, um, you know, I don't know what exactly you have in mind, but I do know that that uh, most religions, false religions or, or what, what not, have personal motivations for you to be in them. They're, they kind of have a way for you to have some sort of itching ears that, that, it, uh, that it satisfies some sort of itch within you, whether it's self-righteousness or, or whatever it is. So, you know, um, when I look at, at the scriptures, I can tell you that from what I see... Sorry, I don't usually have my cell phone on, but I had to call the police on someone today, so that might be them calling back, but I'm not going to... Oh, wait, uh, let me run. Hold on. <laughs> I told them I was going to be talking to Mitch and Eve, so the police are going to be doing an investigation now. 
<laughs> well, I, I guess what I was getting at is, it, it, is that when you're confused and you don't know the gospel, it's easy to be it's easy to be uh, led astray. If you don't know if you don't know God, then then it's really easy to be snagged in. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm wondering is, what is the main attraction for people to become a Mormon or uh, stay a Mormon? Let me, uh, Eve. Why don't you talk for a second? Let me see if I have to take this. <laughs> uh -uh. Don't put me on the spot. Yeah, who's <laughs> I, I wonder if he uh, he didn't include Freemasonry, did he? And no, but that would be another. I, that that may be one of his uh, topics that he's probably going to um, go over when it comes to these these different cults. And I I've studied a little bit of what the Mormons believe. I've studied a little bit of what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. You know, Seventh Day Adventists, what they believe. And I guess the main thing that I see is that there's no reason to even believe half of the stuff that's that that's being purported because it's it's extra biblical. In other words, well. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I just, as far as the uh, uh, SDAs, um, I actually agree with some of the stuff that they hold to. Well, I not completely. I, I do. Be, I don't believe in the traditional view of hell, and I don't think Scripture teaches it. But with that said, um, there's a lot of things that I don't agree with with them. Sometimes with stuff, you just got to kind of chew the meat and spit out the bones. Oh, absolutely. I, I you know, every, every, every. Everything is based on some things that are true. Yeah, uh, that was uh, that was with the Millerite movement was the beginning of the uh, SDAs, and this guy Miller, who was uh, supposedly a very brainy guy, decided that he could see, even though Jesus said that nobody would know the day and hour, he would know the day that Christ would return, and he had everybody on top of the hill, and Christ didn't return. So after he left the religion, then E.G. White came in and uh, her partner, and they decided that it was because we weren't observing the Sabbath that Christ did not return at the at, at this time. Well, and that's the problem I have with them because, you know, Christ is the Sabbath rest. So, you know, that, <laughs> that whole idea to me is, is completely squashed, and, and the Bible totally shows it as... You know, Christ is Christ is our Sabbath rest. So I don't understand why people are putting that rule. That's another rule and regulation. That's a form of control again uh, to say you have to do this. Because even worshiping on Sunday, people think that it's the day of rest and that it's a rule that you must go to church on Sunday. It's not found anywhere in Scripture. It just said that the early apostles worshipped on Sunday. So that's what we traditionally do, but there's nowhere that it's commanded that we should go on Sunday. Okay, guys. Um, yeah, that was the police. I had to take that, so I'm sorry for the interruption. It's uh, normally I have all my phones try to turn them off during a show or a video, uh, but that was necessary. So uh, uh, hopefully I, I don't have to be distracted again from that. But let me ask Eve if you if, did you answer it while I was gone, or will you answer it now? What is what attracts people into Mormonism, and what once they get into it, what keeps them into Mormonism? Um, I, I don't really know, <laughs> to be honest. Um, okay, yeah. let me tell you uh, what I think. Uh, the, I, I checked today the statistics, and uh, Mormonism worldwide is only about 14 million people, and I'm guessing that the vast majority of those are in the United States. And that's a tiny part of the population. Uh, most Mormons, of course, some people j join Mormonism because of the people, one of these missionaries knocking on the door and convincing them to join. But a lot of more people become Mormons because they're born into a Mormon family. They have a lot of children that they consider a responsibility to have a lot of children. So they have big families. They reproduce more Mormons uh, through childbirth. Uh, and, and then, but really, the main attraction, the main selling point about Mormonism is not the theology. It's the uh, when I was in college, I joined a fraternity, and it was a lot of fun. But uh, since I finished college in 1974, for many, many years, some of my friends, we've still had our association, and it's a, like a brotherhood where you help each other, you get jobs, you you know, and you you just it's you you have a lot of contacts for business. 
Uh, and so uh, some people join Kiwanis or Rotary or Lions Clubs because they're in an association of people that's going to benefit them in their business. So one reason is that because of the, those kinds of benefits by joining this organization and the main attraction I think is the idea that they sell these family values. That Mormons are virtuous, they have good families, they have old-fashioned family values, and this is why a lot of people are attracted to it. And they, the reason they won't leave, and even if they understand that the religion is craziness, they, they won't leave because they don't care about theology, they don't care about God for the most part. Now, what they care about is maintaining the relationship with their family and their friends and their contacts. Because if they left, just like Jehovah Witnesses, there's a shunning that goes on. So uh, uh, it's very difficult for someone to leave Mormonism uh, because they it costs them uh, costs them a lot in terms of relationships. It happens all over the place. I mean, in every like even in even in the church that I was, the Lordship Church that I was in, you know, they were instrumental in in helping me out when I needed things. They were right there. But when I started going against their doctrine, forget about it. That I was I was left into the, you know cut loose. Same mm -hmm. thing with the Judaism, you know. So it's you know so that is widespread everywhere. Where you know when you're part of a fellowship, you get all the perks, you know, especially in religious communities that are very that have money. You know, uh, like the Jews uh, are a huge, huge religious community, and the rabbi controls a lot of the business that goes on. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so so that's that's widespread. Mm -hmm. Let well, me ask Eve. Can Eve, while I'm mm -hmm. thinking about this, I'll, don't lose your thought, okay? But you know, Tanya is out of town and couldn't be here, and she's always been very helpful to me. And I, I don't want to impose this on you if it's if it's too much to ask. But somehow she's able to watch the comments that come on the video and post them or tell me someone has a comment or a question. Is, is it possible for you to do that? Do you know how and are you, would you be able to yeah, do I that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so yeah. If anybody makes an interesting comment uh, on the video or has a question, let's bring it to our attention and we'll, uh, we'll uh, discuss it. Okay, Eve, what were you going to say about this? Well, I was going to agree with Mitch and... Uh, you know, it, it's found. It's found even not even. It doesn't even have to be in these cults. It's found that whole aspect where you get the perks. It's found in any church almost. Atheism. I mean, even the churches I grew up in, you know, uh, where there's no denomination and uh, Church of Christ and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's all over the place. If you start going against what they teach, if you qu even question, it's shunned upon. So, you know, it's sad, I think. Okay. So, but my my thesis here, is I'm 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 putting this forward as a as a uh, proposition. Most people don't join Mormonism because of theology. They get into Mormonism because they're born into a Mormon family or they're recruited into Mormonism and the main attraction to them is the family values and the value in that respect rather than theology. They just accept the theology as, as, okay, that's fine, but what they really want out of it is the big gymnasium that they can all play play their sports in and, and all the, 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 the social and the possible business contacts. So a lot of people uh, I found in Mormons, uh, even if they understand that the religion is uh, absurd and it's based on uh, uh, someone who's easily proven to be uh, you know, dishonest uh, thief and, and uh, uh, Joseph Smith, and that it, you, it's easily proven that the Book of Mormon uh, is just a fabricated book of fiction, uh, that they may not even care about that because they don't want to leave their network of friends and family. Okay, that being said, uh, for the rest of the people who want to know about the theology of Mormonism and their doctrines, uh, there are basically four books that Mormons use. The Book of Mormon was the original one. Uh, Joseph Smith is given credit for uh, writing it, uh, interpreting it through this, like uh, the, the method that he used to do it, that he was purported to have used, is right out of something out of like uh, Harry Potter. It's just such a ridiculous story of, uh, of how he came up with this Book of Mormon. But I found something today that was interesting. Uh, let me see. Uh, it says that most scholars have come to the conclusion the Book of Mormon was originally a romantic novel 
written by Solomon Spaulding. Uh, Smith and Rigdon had the clear opportunity to steal it and then reworked it by inserting their religious material. The evidence for this has been gathered by uh, Crowdry and Davis and Scales in their book, Who Wrote the Book of Mormon? So here's uh, an idea that I wasn't aware of is that uh, uh, a lot of people who've studied this out come to the conclusion that uh, the Book of Mormon is not even originally from Joseph Smith. Uh, but wh whoever wrote the book, it's, it's clearly proven to be uh, uh, completely wrong in every way, historically and, and so on. And, and as I said, if you go to my playlist and look at the videos, the Bible versus the Book of Mormon, those people go into great detail on those areas. So to me, uh, the, the Mormon religion uh, starts off with this foundation, that Joseph Smith is this prophet that's going to give the truth because the, the Christianity has gone into apostasy and someone has to restore it. Uh, and, and so Joseph Smith says he's the one that got, got this message from an angel uh, named Moroni and gave him this uh, ability to read these uh, writings and translate them. And then uh, uh, the story that of the Book of Mormon, as I said, is easily proven to be, you know, completely wrong in every way. So if we, if we know a little bit about the person, Joseph Smith, and his past, that he was a con man and, and that, uh, uh, it, it, what his, his character was, and then we understand that the Book of Mormon itself is all historically and archaeologically proven wrong, and that genetically it's impossible for these people to have come, as it says in the Book of Mormon, then the, this Book of Mormon comes to a collapses. Uh, and and uh, this kind of house of cards that's built on Joseph Smith and the Mo Book of Mormon falls down. So I think one of the best ways for a person to understand that Mormonism is false is to study this out and find that the Book of Mormon is just fabricated and pr easily proven to be uh, fiction. Uh, so the, the other, they have other writings since the Book of Mormon, though. They have a book called The Pearl of Great Price, uh, they have these things called journals and disc journal and discourse, uh, and, and then then they also have the Bible, the King James Bible is what they they use. However, of all of those things, the Bible is considered to be the least of all of them, according to Mormons. It's the the Book of Mormon and the other writings from the Mormons that is really the authority, and they do not use the Bible as really the authority. So these are kind of the four pillars or the four uh, uh, scriptures that they, they use for the, to get their truth. Uh, and I'm going to be citing this as I go through this material that I've prepared here. I'm going to be citing uh, verbatim what their writings say. So let's start now, unless someone has something else to, to say, what I've said so far. Okay. Um, First of all, let's start with this teaching here. The current teaching of the Mormon Church. Christ's death brought release from the grave and universal resurrection. Salvation by grace is universal resurrection. Beyond this, man must earn his place in heaven. Of course, this be done, must be done through the LDS Church. And this is a quote from Doctrines of Salvation, uh, and it says, quote, The atonement of Jesus is of a twofold nature. Because of it, all men are redeemed from mortal death and the grave and will rise in the resurrection to immortality of the soul. Then again, by obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel, man will receive remission of individual sins through the blood of Jesus and will inherit exaltation in the kingdom of God, which is eternal. That's from the writing Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, page 123. Now, I have scriptures in mind to refute that, but I want to ask you what comes to mind. Uh, what does the Bible say about that, that doctrine? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, let's let's put it this way with uh, with, with with what I hear from um, this book and the Baltimore Catechism and the Tanakh 
versus the Talmud, it seems like what happens is, is we have the original scriptures, or the Bible, which preaches a message of grace, and then we have another book that comes around and tells you, oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. The gospel is bad, but the gospel didn't save you completely. You still need to work to save yourself, in which case you're damned, because if it's up to you, there's no possible way that you could measure up. As a matter of fact, according to Romans, um, uh, was it chapter 7, he says, you know, I keep doing these things. Why? Because I'm under the law, sin now has advantage over me, and I can't follow the law and, and, able, and, and, and be able to, to reach heaven to be good enough. Basically, the thing that Christ took away, the law, so that this way we could rejoice in grace, has now been replaced again with works. It seems like the same message all over again. Somehow or another, the grace of Christ and the good news that set us free and makes us rejoice has been taken away to give us what? It, it's bait and switch. It's like, here's the good news, here's the bad news, and it's like, like you, oh, well, I got, the, I got the bad news, I got the good news, oh, well, here's the bad news back again. It's, mm -hmm. I, it seems like the this, this same message all over again from every church where you're given grace and then grace is exchanged for the law. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea that uh, Jesus' death for our sins and faith in him is uh, not quite enough. It's insufficient. Uh, and, and that there's much more that is required and it's up to each individual to do this extra stuff uh, to satisfy God and receive eternal life and the kingdom of God. This is this is a premise that runs through every religion that's, that is associated with Jesus. It's all based on Jesus is not enough and more is required and that is kind of the definition of religion. It's based upon man's able, ability to perform to, to satisfy God. Eve, what were you going to say? Oh, well, I was just going to say, basically, uh, I, I wanted to know, though, do they believe that uh, those who don't, <laughs> it's kind of funny how they say you have to work in the LSD church to get there, too, but do they believe that those who don't, um, you know, work, go to hell, or do they believe that they just, there's some type of hierarchy in heaven, and they have to work to get a certain position in heaven? Uh, well, we're going to get to that later as we go through this, uh, but really, uh, the only people who actually go to hell, I'm jumping way, way ahead, the only people who actually go to hell are people who become Mormons and leave it. That's another reason you can't ever leave Mormonism. <laughs> Everybody else lives, and, but you don't reach the highest levels of heaven unless you're a Mormon okay. that does all the Mormon stuff. Okay. That's just kind of what I wanted to know because of just the way you were, um, the way you were you know, reading off what they believed, I was like, I wasn't fully understanding. But, you know, I have a lot, a, a whole lot of universalist friends, and, and they don't even take it that far. Most of them believe that it's, well, all of them that I know believe that it's by grace. It's not, you don't work. So, I mean, and I don't agree with the universalist, but I'm just saying, even the universalists that I know that believe that everyone is resurrected, they, they believe it's by grace. Well, so that's weird. Yeah, you, you have friends who are universalists. You have friends that maybe uh, uh, you would say these are not Christians. Their, their belief system is definitely not Christian and yet you're friends with them. And uh, I think that's per personally that's very accept acceptable to me. I have still have some Mormon friends in my life that I've had for since I was 12 years old. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, but there's a difference between having a friendship with someone and loving them and caring about them and having fellowship with them. Uh, I can only have fellowship with someone who, who shares my core beliefs. Uh, that's where fellowship comes in. But you can't have a, a – it's, it's far more superficial, the, the kind of relationship, but there's nothing wrong. You don't have to disassociate with everybody just because they're not a Christian, in other words. Well, I, I don't consider universalists not the ones I know not a Christian because they all do trust in, in Jesus Christ and what he did and, and solely upon him. So yeah. they might have issues with everything else, but mm -hmm. that's true. And but whether it's universal or something else, you you could still be a friend with someone, whether they're a Christian or not. 
Uh, now, I don't know if you intended this as a joke, Eve, or if it just accidentally came out. Came out that way. Way. <laughs> hey, Brother Joseph, welcome. Thanks, Luke. Sorry I'm late. I got stuck in Seattle traffic from downtown. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I'm not going to try to recap too much. I laid a foundation early on, uh, and we just started going through what Mormons' doctrines are, and we're comparing their doctrine to what the scriptures say. Uh, but welcome, I'm glad you could make it, and I know Brother Mitch is happy to see you, because I told him what you wrote about in the last uh, uh, Friday Night Fellowship about wanting to make a special video, just take excerpt from what he said. It, it was an incredible little four or five minute excerpt that I thought everybody should see. I thought it was a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, presentation. Really? Yeah. I I'm, I'm 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 flattered, but it was it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah. Okay, well, be brother Joseph, be be brace yourself because brother Mitch has a lot more golden nuggets he's going to give be giving us. <laughs> it okay. all comes from Christ, well, not from me. <laughs> now, 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 sister Eve, sister Eve, she was just talking and she had a slip of the tongue. And if you want, you can watch the video back, Eve, and you can see you referred to these Mormons as the, the Church of LSD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Now, it, technically, their, their church is well, called... Well, hey, it. some of their ideas, you know. <laughs> technically, now, I, I know that when I watch my videos back later, sometimes I see I misspoke. Sometimes I say the exact opposite thing I intended to say, you know, a slip of the tongue or something. We're not perfect, but they are not called the Church of LSD. They're the church, the LDS Church. Okay. Well, they're well. I'm dyslexic too, so you know. <laughs> okay. Now the other thing that I would say is that I've done the same kind of thing because this angel, this purported angel that appeared to Joseph Smith, uh, the angel's name. Joseph Smith came up with his name, uh, Moroni. Moroni. Now, if we take the I off the end of it, it means it says moron. And I think this may be Joseph Smith's way of laughing under his breath to everybody who hears this story of the Book of Mormon. He's laughing, thinking, I'm telling him this angel named Moron came to me and taught me all this stuff, you know. So <laughs> he, the name of the angel was Moron, Moron I. And, he, and it's the Church of LSD, according to Eve. Okay, but uh, let, me, let me say also, we're talking about these basic problem. Mormonism is, says faith in Jesus is not enough. Uh, you've got to join the Mormon church and you've got to do all these works in addition, okay? Uh, well, we just point out that that's what all the religions say, uh, that, that faith in Jesus is insufficient. They all say that something else is needed by man. You've got to do X, Y, and Z to satisfy God in addition to believing in Jesus. So in that respect, it's just another religion. But the origin is very interesting because we're going to be talking about Jehovah Witnesses and Roman Catholics. And now Islam is not a cult, as I defined it. It's a, it's a false religion. I defined a cult as something that is c considered by many people to be Christian, and, and yet it's false Christianity. Eve, what were you saying? Well, I was going to ask if you were if you planned on talking about uh, Freemasonry too. No, uh, I wasn't intended on doing that, but uh, that's probably a good subject to get into eventually, uh, uh, because it definitely is a, a cult, and uh, yeah. a lot of people think a lot of people think of it as as Christian, but it's really eclectic. Mm -hmm. It's everything, and really, it's Luciferian if you finally get into it. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing about Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, um, Roman Catholicism and uh, even Islam, is they all say that the scriptures, our holy scriptures, this is our source of truth. They say this is wrong. It's corrupt. It's not enough. The Roman Catholics say that uh, you, uh, you have to go by the tradition of the popes and the, 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 you know, the, the church fathers. Uh, that that's, uh, even supersedes the scriptures. Uh, Mormons say that the Christianity and the Bible was corrupted and they had to come up with a new book and they got this Book of Mormon from an angel. Uh, interesting enough, 
uh, in Islam, the same thing. Muhammad said that Christianity was corrupted, and, and uh, Muhammad said an angel appeared to him and gave him another book, the Quran. So in that way, Mormonism and, and uh, Islam are the same. They, they have a, a new prophet that is, comes up with a new book to correct the Bible and Christianity. And then, so we got, uh, they're all that in that respect. They all want to say this Christianity, as we discussed in these hymns that we went through on Friday night, all these hymns and the scriptures say it's all about Jesus and being our Savior, and uh, the, the work of man is just uh, has nothing to do with it as far as becoming saved. But all these religions say, no, it, it's the work of man. Uh, were you going to say something, Joseph? Yeah, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Mormons are King James Version only people, aren't they? Yes, they are. But they say the Bible uh, is only correct as so long as it's interpreted correctly. And so anytime you point out a verse to them that refutes them, they'll say, well, you're interpreting it wrong, and they have to come up with some twisted pretzel-like interpretation to, to conform to their, their doctrines. Uh, so we presented their first uh, false doctrine, and I, gave, I cited it. It's from Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, page 123, and it said that Jesus dying for our sins, faith in Jesus uh, is not enough, uh, that um, every man has to do uh, obedience to the laws and ordinances uh, in addition to that. So now I'm asking, can you cite scriptures that contradict this idea that we must, in addition to belief, faith in Jesus as our Savior, what is a scripture that clearly states, <laughs> Mitch turned into a dog, it's, it's the work of a wizard. <laughs> That shape shifting that's in there, you know. Yeah, you're not going to be a shape shifter until the resurrection. Okay, well, I have food, so that's why the dog is leering at me. So, uh, I <laughs> I may have to run and eat my lunch. So, uh, I stop back if I can. Okay. Very good. I, I have uh, I have a lot of verses in mind, but I'm going to ask you guys to provide a verse that comes to mind. What verse can you think of that says faith alone? That oh. our faith is enough, that nothing else is needed. Romans uh, 4 5, or it might be 5 4. Okay. Uh, he that what, believeth and does not work, something like that. Uh, to, to the man that worketh not, but believeth on the one who justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Uh, I would say, in parting, uh, I would say that, that, that we walk by faith. I live my life by faith. I, you know, I don't live it by works. I live it by faith. But faith in what? Faith in the gospel. And I really think that that's where all these cults lead. They don't put the, their faith in the gospel. They don't put their faith in the in, in the blood of Christ. You know, and and that's where that's where they all go awry. They're putting their faith in the wrong place. They're putting them, their faith in themselves. Anyway, I've, mm -hmm. I've got to go, so, okay. so take care, everybody, and, and, yeah. and I hope that everything runs well. See okay, you take, later. All right, brother, come back if you have time. We'll be going till 4. Okay, uh, there's a lot of proof texts I could give you. Um, how about uh, uh, Romans 3, uh, 3.28? Uh, Paul says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Um uh, how about Ephesians 2.8.9 it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, and I could give you right now uh, probably um, you know, several dozen scriptures that are just that clear, that say faith is the only requirement, works are not required at all. Okay, so we can clearly refute the, the idea of Mormonism that faith is not enough. In addition to faith, it says uh, obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, man re receives remission of sins. Okay, who's this? Oh, okay, good. Hi. Hi, Brother Chad. Can't hear you. Turn your mic on. Okay. Hey there. What's All up? Right. Good. Well, welcome to the study. Uh, we've got Sister yeah. Eve and Brother Joseph here with us, okay? Hello. Uh, 
All right, so we'll, we'll just move on. Uh, it, it would take too long to catch you up, so I'm just going to continue on where we are. Uh, now let's look at uh, this teaching of Mormonism. Baptism must be performed by LDS priesthood and is absolutely necessary for salvation. And it says in the book Doctrines, Doctrine and Covenants. Remember, they have four books that they use. The least of them is the Bible. That's the least of their concern. They place the least value. All the other books supersede the Bible in a Mormon's opinion. And in their books, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, 84 colon 74, it says, quote, Verily, verily, I, meaning Christ, say unto you, the answer, Joseph Smith, they who believe not on your words are not bab and are not baptized in water in my name for the remission of their sins that they may receive the Holy Ghost shall be damned. So here we see two things in this part from their Doctrine and Covenants. It says that who, if you do not believe in Joseph Smith's words and be baptized in water, that you will uh, be damned. Okay, so we got two things there. One is that you got to believe in Joseph Smith and what he said, and then two, you've got to be baptized in water or you're not saved. So let's take them one at a time. Well, um, they're replacing Christ with Joseph Smith. So exactly, of exactly right. Instead of believing in Christ, they're saying, hey, you got to believe in this guy over here mm -hmm. that uh, heard a message from a moron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's Mormons, not morons. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. It was the mor the, the angel moron eye. Moron eye was the angel that appeared to Joseph Smith. Anybody? <laughs> now, okay, so... Uh, uh, remember that playlist I've mentioned uh, several times I have, Mormonism Debunked. Uh, if you go to that and you see the testimonials of some Mormons who left, and they talk about their lives, and some of these people had advanced to the highest levels uh, of Mormonism, highest offices of their church, their religion. And uh, these people talk about what it was like to be a Mormon. It was Jesus Christ had very little to do with it. If you go to a Mormon service, the name Jesus Christ hardly even comes up. It's all about Joseph Smith. There's a, like the, them even putting the name Jesus Christ in the name of their church is ridiculous because it has so little to do with Jesus, according to them. Yes, Joseph. Joseph, have you ever? I mean, I, I've spoken to a, a couple of Mormons uh, in the past over the past few years, and they really focus on their Christianity. I mean, they they totally focus on. Uh, the King James Version Bible and uh, and and Christian speak. I mean, you can't tell that they're not Christian yeah, unless yeah. you really uh, start digging. I mean, I I couldn't. I was like, well, you guys sound good to me. You know, uh, <laughs> I mean, you're a little weird with your white shirts and ties and bicycles, but you know, I couldn't tell they weren't Christian until I went and and did research after I quit talking to them because you know everything I said they agreed with and. Kind of vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, brother, I've had that same experience over the years. I've had numerous interactions with them where they knock on the door and I invite them in. And uh, it, I said earlier, I reached a point where I'm probably on on a blacklist where they they won't come over anymore because of uh, what I, the way I've dealt with them. Not me, not mean spirited, but just proven that they're lying. First, they lie about what they believe. Uh, the last time they came over, basically, the first thing I said to them was I said, look, I've heard it said that Mormons are polytheists, that Mormons believe in many gods, not just one, and that Mormons also believe that, that each Mormon can eventually become a god of their own planet. Now, uh, it, it, is that true? Oh, no, 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 that's not true, that's not true. I said, well, you're, you're sure that's not true because, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have an, and I was a little playing dumb. I was setting a trap for them, so they denied it. 
And then about an hour later into the presentation and the dialogue, the truth came out. We had them cornered. And, and the truth came out. And I said, why did you lie to me? You, what you said in the very beginning, I asked you very direct questions, and you gave me outright lies. Why did you do that? And they said, well, because you're not ready for meat. You're only ready for milk. Oh, man, wow. You see? So it's part of their training is to lie and misrepresent what they are, what they believe. Uh, they want to come across as just family value Christians, the, the, the best Christians. We have the best family values and really get people interested in those things. And they, their terminology, yeah, they're born again. Uh, and and they, they, they believe all the things, all the terminology that you, we're, you, we're accustomed to using, they use those same terms, but their definitions for those terms are completely different than our definitions. And it, and takes, it, takes, a while, a while. it takes a while to really, as you say, uh, kind of root it all out and get the truth out of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's very sneaky. I, I, I wanted to share with you guys, I had a... Um, an experience when I was getting called, brother Luke, you know a little bit about this. I was called in jail actually, and but our, our jail here in Henderson, uh, it's, it's the HDC down here, are, is, is owned by by Mormons. So I had the pleasure of having uh, they have the King James version in there as well, but they also have Mormon Bibles. And I looked at it, and it's it's basically just if anybody's looked at it before, it's it it's uh, it has the the basically the foreword of the Joseph Smith story which is just a bunch of hocus pocus and then the rest of it is basically the Bible chopped up and it's just, just kind of like uh, Ben Sira in the Quran it's just um, they take they take you know a lot of truth and then they mix in you know all that BS and that's those are usually the best lies or the ones that have a whole lot of truth and then that ultimately though is the it's a big old lie so mm-hmm so you said that the the jail was owned by the Mormons. The, I know that Henderson is is owned by Mormons. That's scary. I, it is really scary. And then and they can't get yeah. out unless you convert. Yeah, man, it's just weird. But at least they do they do offer the um, they offer the Bible more than the uh, Mormon Bible. But you can always find a Mormon Bible in there though, and uh, and it's owned by the. They're a lot. They're they're very uh, monetary. You know, they love the money so okay so for this last uh, point I'm going to bring up the over and over again I'm going to quote their own sources their own writings uh, that declare what they believe and then we're going to look for scripture to see if it agrees now can we find anything in scripture that says that we've got to be a Mormon and and believe every word of Joseph Smith there's nothing in Scripture that says that. On the contrary, it's faith in Jesus and faith in our, the Holy, Holy Scriptures in the Bible that we're, we're told to believe, right? The other thing that they posed was the idea that you must be water baptized. Now, are Mormons the only people that say that you must be water baptized before you're saved, before you can be saved? I've got a son-in-law that uh, is a Christian who... Uh, it's just convinced that if you're not uh, water submerged, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, baths and hot tubs don't count. What's that? I said, I guess baths and hot tubs don't count. <laughs> well, you could be baptized in a bath or a hot tub. I was baptized in a swimming pool. I no, the, you, you didn't know that if there's chlorine in the water, no. If there's chlorine, then the whole water baptism is it doesn't work. It's not oh, naturally pure. Know. That must have invalidated my baptism. Uh, my friend Tony, he's waiting to get board, baptized the correct way in the Jordan River in Israel. Uh, but the point is, I think we all agree that, um, well, there, there's very few, few points on water baptism that I, I made a, Q&A video someone asked me about what I thought of water baptism and uh, there's basically several groups some people think that water baptism is essential you're not saved until you get wet these this this concept is called baptismal regeneration they believe you're not regenerated that means born again it's Christian, brought to life uh, you're you're not born again until you get dunked in the water okay baptismal regeneration church of christ some Pentecostals, they believe that water baptism, uh, you're not saved until you get wet. 
Uh, Dr. Ruckman refers to these people as the water dogs, the people that think you've got to get in the water. <clears throat> then there's another opposite group of people. I've made videos about these people too. These are the hyper-dispensationalists that believe that Paul is the only apostle, that the others were uh, not even real Christians. John, Peter, all the other, they never really became Christians. Only Paul was the first Christian, and Paul's the only one the author that we should consider, and that uh, they reject everything else except Paul. It's Paul onlyism. And they take the position Paul that you better not get wet. So, on one hand, the baptismal regenerationist people, these water dogs, they insist you get wet. The hyper-dispensationalists, they're the opposite. They say you better not get wet because if you get wet, it's proving your faith is not in Jesus, but your faith is in the work of being baptized. They can say this is a work. You're putting your faith in that work. So they forbid being wet. I take the position that water baptism is not necessary at all. On the other hand, I do encourage people to get water baptized because this is an opportunity. This is one of the, my first opportunities after I got saved. When I got water baptized, I was making a public statement. Look, I'm not ashamed. Uh, I'm getting baptized in front of my friends and family and the congregation. Uh, Jesus is my Savior. So it's a way for people to declare publicly uh, their faith in Jesus and this, this um, conversion. Uh, but it's not required. And it shouldn't be forbidden. And the scriptures support this. Say, what do you guys say about this uh, well, water baptism? Well, um, I consider I, I was baptized at the age of eight, but um, I, I don't believe it as a requirement. Matter of fact, I believe that if someone considers it a requirement, it's works. Uh, it's an outward works by by the hands. But I do consider it <clears throat> as a memorial. Uh, same type of way that I would consider taking communion. Uh, it's a type of uh, memorial. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the hyper D's also would forbid communion. Also, it has no that has no place in the church uh, since Paul. Even though Paul talked about it in the scriptures, he's talking about people don't don't eat too much when you come and have your communion. Don't use it as your dinner. You know, Paul says that. So, <laughs> and yet they say that it's not something for that for us today. You know. Um, okay, now um, it's easy to, to disprove that water is not required because of all the verses that say uh, that uh, believing in Jesus is the only requirement and there's no mention of water. So that, that's easily easy disproven. Uh, now let's look at the next tenet of Mormonism. Can I say something real quick? Luke? Yes. Well, and uh, I think people fail to realize that Jesus is the living water. And we are baptized in him. And they, they fail to see the spiritual nature of, of spiritual baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Paul says there's uh, it one faith, one church, one baptism. I'm not sure I said that correctly. But, but the one baptism that everybody gets automatically is the, the Holy Spirit in, comes in. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit. That means we're indwelled. And, and then he never leaves us because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that happens at the moment we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior. So this is the common baptism that we all share. It's a spiritual baptism. The water is something that I recommend people doing because it gives you a chance of publicly declaring your conversion uh, to faith in Christ. Uh, but if someone did, didn't want to do it for some reason, then they're, they're, they're still saved. Okay? Um, uh, brother... Yes. There's uh, some to support uh, what you're just saying. is uh, John 3, 5. I don't know if you mentioned it before, but it says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. And that misconception of uh, born of water, it just I think it just simply means birth, natural birth, not uh, baptism of water. Um, I think that's a common misconception because I grew up believing that you had to get dunked in water too because that's just... Uh, that, that seems to be a common misconception. Well, well, and again, Christ is the living water, and when we accept Christ, we are baptized in right. that living water. Yeah. yeah, those are both very good, valid points, and you know that a human's body is, I don't know, 98% water or something. You know? right. right. And when we're born, before we come out of our mother's womb, the water breaks. These are all ways of understanding this idea of being born of water, and that Jesus is the living water. Uh, so, 
Uh, but the, the main way of refuting this is just pointing out the dozens of dozens of verses that tell us we are saved by faith alone and there's no reference to water. Okay? So uh, uh, if, if, the, if water was essential, hey, Brother Austin. Yo! Welcome. Um, I, I don't know if you saw any of it yet, but we're talking about the Mormon teachings and then comparing it to what the scriptures say. Okay. All right. Um, now let's go to the next Mormon teaching. And it says, uh, the current teaching of Mormon church. The Book of Mormon is purported to be, quote, a second witness to the Bible, unquote. A witness that condemns and claims the Bible is an error. First Nephi 13, 24 through 40 informs us that many plain and precious things, unquote, are taken from the Bible, verse 28. And, and Second Nephi chapter 29 states that anyone who claims the Bible is sufficient and they need no other book is a fool. The Mormon church has four books which are accepted as scripture. Quote, by the standard of works of the church is meant the following four volumes of scripture. The Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. The church uses the King James Version of the Bible, but acceptance of the Bible is coupled with a reservation that it is true only insofar as translated correctly. That's the eighth article of faith. The three... The other three, having been revealed in modern times in English, are accepted without qualification. Book of Mormon, written by, um, written by Bruce McConkie, page 764. So they're saying not only is the Bible unreliable, uh, uh, but the other books supersede them. And that, uh, uh, so what, how do we see that? Well, and they're saying that the Bible has to be <clears throat> interpreted by man um, instead of trusting that the Bible actually interprets itself. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, in this case, look, let's look at a few scriptures here. Uh, can anybody look this up if you're quick? Uh, Matthew 24, 35. Oh, I love that. I love that one. The end of days. Matthew 24, 35. If you, whoever finds it first, read it, please. I got you right here. Um, In truth, I tell you, before this generation, or sorry, 35, sky and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Okay. But, right there. That's all I want. My words will never pass away. Okay? So the idea from Islam and Mormonism, Roman Catholicism, Jehovah Witnesses all say the Bible has been corrupted and that it's it's in error and it needs to be corrected with their their teachings. And this says the Scripture says, "My word shall never pass away." I got another verse, but anybody else want to speak about that verse? I'm just uh, surprised that uh, there's such controversy amongst mainline Christian denominations on the same kind of points that these guys make. They they carry it a little further. Mm -hmm. I'm in, I yeah. Just in the everlasting part. Uh, Austin, turn your volume up. You're, you're very faint. Oh, is it? Turn your volume up. And, and then talk, because we could barely hear you. Can you guys hear me now? A little louder. Can you guys hear me now? A little louder, a little more. Hey, can anybody hear me now? Okay, that's good. That's good. We can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Now, what were you, what were you saying? Awesome. I was, I was going to say the everlasting part. If God would be everlasting, well, so would his word be. Mm hmm Okay. That's a good point. That's a good, just like a, a logical connection. Uh, now let's go to Matthew 5.18. Someone find that as quick as you can. Matthew 5.18. Five eighteen. Uh-huh. Eve, mine's a, Eve, it's a mix of Aramaic, uh, Greek, and Hebrew. It's kind mm -hmm. of a weird one. Um, it says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. 
Okay, so here we have the Bible itself declaring what uh, Austin just said, that God's eternal and his word is eternal. He says, till heaven and earth pass away, my every jot and tittle will remain. From the law. So, will not what? That's talking about the law. The law is part of the scripture, though. You see, the, the scripture, according to Judaism, is in two compartments, the law and the prophets. The law is everything written from, uh, from Moses all the way through, I think, uh, maybe Deuteronomy. And then the prophets are all the other prophets that follow the, those books there. But the law and the prophets just refers to the Old Testament scriptures. Okay? And now, of course, we, as Christians... We well, believe the Old Testament has been extended, the scriptures have been extended to include the New Testament scriptures. The verse right before that talks about he comes to de uh, not to destroy but to fulfill. So that's what he came to do. And then it talks about it shall not pass from the law. One jot or one tittle shall not in no way pass from the law. And he's talking about fulfilling the law. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, think, I think the Mormons would say... Uh, that they completely are in agreement with that uh, as far as the original version or the original Greek and Hebrew are concerned. But when you translate it into any language outside the Greek and Hebrew, you're going to have error and you're going to have uh, opinion and, and transliteration <laughs> rather than a translation, and they're going to play on that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to say I, I kind of disagree with using this verse for that, but I do... Uh, Luke, I do uh, know of a verse, uh, and I'm not sure what the uh, chapter and verse is, but I think it's in Isaiah, uh, where the Lord promises to preserve his word. How about and, Isaiah 40, uh, 40 verse 8? Okay. I think your, your, uh, your point was well made on that last verse, though. Go ahead. Now, how about Isaiah 48? Let's see if that one works for us. While they're doing that, I was going to do, uh, I like to do John 6.63. Go ahead. And it was uh, just the significance of God's word and how and what he says it is. And uh, Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Mm -hmm. and I can read uh, Isaiah Amen. 48. Okay, who's got Isaiah 40, verse 8? I got it. The uh, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. All right, is that one satisfactory, Eve? Yeah. Okay, I, I saw your I saw your criticism. I think it was a, a well well placed criticism on the other verse. Uh, okay, um, read that one more time, and let's see if we can agree that this verse pretty much nails the the issue. Okay. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. Okay, so the word of God shall stand forever. Now, of course, Brother Joseph brought up the fact, well, that's the original scriptures, and now, you know, we don't have the originals. I mean, a lot of people are going to argue about the, the uh, inerrancy of the Bible because nobody has originals. So that's a totally different uh, problem. Um, but the Mormons say, oh, yeah, the Bible's corrupted, so now we have this new prophet, Joseph Smith, who has been historically proven to be a, a con man, dishonest, and uh, then we have this fallacious Book of Mormon that's proven to be a fabricated book of fiction, and they're going to believe that that take, has taken the place of our holy scriptures. Um, let's look at one more, see if uh, uh, Psalm 119, verse 89. Well, Luke, you also have, a, and I've heard people point this out before, you, you have uh, where people will say, well, you know, when the word, word, is used in Scripture, it could be referring to Christ or the Scriptures. Um, but you can look it up. I mean, the verse that I was talking about where God promised to preserve His Word, I do believe that that is actually uh, referring to uh, Scripture. 
and and God also told them many many times write yeah. this down so yeah yeah very well done very, very that's true uh, brother Mitch welcome back uh, we're pointing out now that Joseph Smith in, in, in the book the Mormon doctrine uh, uh, says that uh, uh, we need to believe in uh, th these other books rather than the Bible they're superior to the Bible uh, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Journal and Discourse, and that they're superior to the Bible, and we're citing verses that say, no, the Bible's sufficient and perfect. And and we, what was the last one? Did we look at, what was the last one I asked you to look up? Uh, Psalm uh, 119, verse 89, I think. And anybody, anybody have that one? Yeah, it's, uh, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Okay. And then it says, the word of God shall stand forever. Did First Peter one twenty five? did we do that one? First Peter one twenty Mitch, why don't you tell us? Don't you have all the scriptures memorized? Yeah. <laughs> what was it, Brother Luke? First Peter, what? First, First Peter, Peter 125. I was, I, was uh, I guess I'm getting feedback. So if, when one person is talking, if everybody could mute, uh, we won't get the feedback like that. And just unmute it when you, you're when you're talking. Uh, I, many years ago in church, I'm sitting down and someone handed me one of their Bibles and I, I said, oh no, I don't need that. I've got it all memorized. That was my attempt at humor. Unless they did. I can't believe no one's told me 1 Peter 1.25 yet. Is that a Is that verse? verse? Is that a yeah, verse? I, I've got it, uh, Brother Luke. You want me to read it? Uh, it says, uh, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Okay. So we got plenty of verses that tell us that this word of God, can you can trust it, it'll it'll stay. It'll 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 stand the test. Um, it won't disappear, it won't pass away, it's settled forever, it'll stand forever. Uh, grass withers, but the word of God stands forever. So these are the what the scriptures say about how we can rely upon the scriptures. <coughs> Uh, now let's look at uh, uh, is the Bible inspired? Uh, anybody know Second uh, Timothy three sixteen and seventeen? All Scripture. Yeah. Well, you know Second my Timothy opinion on that one. <laughs> as far as all Scripture being God breathed, I would say that. Uh, <laughs> uh oh, Mitch, you joined us just in time. <laughs> what for me to get in trouble? Yeah. <laughs> Here, here, here's what I, I got it. I got it right here. Read it, brother. Okay, Second Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Yeah. Did you want me to do seventeen too? Uh, yeah. What does seventeen say? I don't know why I included verse seventeen, but what's it say? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is saying that the scriptures, now what we have accepted in the canon, people can debate whether everything should be in the canon. I know that Roman Catholicism includes a lot of books that, that, uh, uh, that are not in our Bible. Uh, and then we have some books that some people question uh, whether it should be in the, our, our Bible still. And then, uh, uh, and then the question remains, uh, as we discussed on Friday night, Mitch, uh, some books, uh, even though maybe they should be in the Bible, we do, they're so misunderstood by people and misused that uh, it's very rare you can find someone who really kind of fits the puzzle together correctly and understands. And the book of James is one that you've, you've often ranted over. Uh, or should I say rant, brother, or, or just talk? Well, rave, rant. Um, you know, basically on the... On, on, on the on the, the message of the scriptures, the Bible itself. You see, it's a perfect message if you know it from one end to the other. Um, the beginning of it, of course, is the giving of the law, and that was through the eating of the fruit. 
And the answer to it was answered on the cross. So there's a beginning and an end. And what was revealed to the Jews, that the Jews should follow this law, was pointing to the culmination of something, an event that was going to happen. After that event happened, it, what it did was it made a perfect picture of the gospel. The thing is, is that ever since then, even including cults of churches and different people who have been trying to take that perfect message of the gospel and turn it into not the good news, but but works. So, so you know, regardless of 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 scriptures that are extra scriptural, like well, let's say the the Book of Mormon or or what the Jehovah's Witnesses write, or even some of the things that I might you might have been a debated over when it came to the original canon of the scriptures. If you look at the scriptures and you look at the Bible itself. There's a message in there that talks about a Savior, Yeshua. Even by the name, God saves. It's a very simple message that God saves. And it really means that you're free if you know Him. And every other message that's been given, whether extra-scriptural, added to scriptures, or interpreted wrong, has always been interpreted that means God doesn't save, that He saves partially, but now you need to do something. It's always add some sort of works to, to, to something that's great news that ought to set you free. If the gospel doesn't set you free and the Bible doesn't set you free or, or, or the words of the Bible that you read that may have been interpreted whatever way doesn't set you free, then you might just as well crumple it up without, without the, the saving power of Jesus Christ being the message through and through. And it being changed or added to, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do the other. It takes away the joy of our salvation. Mm -hmm. And so well, that's it. It's 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 in it's in the words. Yeshua, He saves, and 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 to me, that's that's the the beginning of it and the end of it. Okay, uh, Eve wanted to say something. First, let me ask uh, Eve. You'll you'll get to talk next, but I know that Brother Joseph wants to record that and make a video out of it, right? It, it is possible. It depends on how sharp she is. She might say something stupid now, but like the LSD thing. Go ahead. No, no, brother, brother Joseph, Mitch's last speech there is worthy of its own video, I think. Okay, okay go ahead. S Sister Eve, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think uh, a, a lot of the problem with people adding works uh, to salvation is that they don't see that um, salvation was never ever based on works, not even in the Old Testament, not even in the Old Covenant. Um, the only salvation that works brought was a physical salvation because the spiritual was always by faith. However, um, if, if, if people in the Old Covenant had broke the commandments or the law, they were to be stoned to death or they had a fear of uh, physical death by judgment from God. So the the physical uh, was was the death that occurred in the in the old system, but the works was never it never brought about uh, spiritual salvation. Eve, uh, if you're finished, I want to reply to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people, even the, in the body of Christ who will disagree and talk about all the dispensations and that people got saved different ways in the past and they're going to get saved different ways in the future. Uh, but I'm under the uh, belief that uh, it's always been faith alone. And, and you remember these Bible talk shows I've been doing now for a few months. We did a series called Old Testament Pictures uh, and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. And we went into great detail making that very point you just made in that series there that uh, uh, all through the Old Testament, they were still saved through faith. The works that they did were to receive blessings, to get to the promised land, and also to not be stoned because they broke some law. You know, so you were absolutely correct on that. Uh, now, uh, I've got more verses to go over, but before we move on, who wants to say anything about what we've just been discussing? Okay, brother Chad. I don't. I don't. Um. I actually. I agree. I believe in faith alone. But and I think it's kind of a, but I read this I just started reading a book uh, called The Joyful Christian by C.S. Lewis and I just want I read this 
Uh, I haven't read much of it, but I, there's just something that speaks on exactly what we're talking about right now. And this is this is his belief. This is not my belief, but I I I do uh, kind of share as I'm reading it. It does make sense to me. Can I just share it real quick? He says uh, his view is because um, there seems to be quite a fight over this, and I, it seems like word a, a fight over wordplay with. But I but I do believe that it, salvation is faith alone. But it but if we do have faith, it seems to me that if we have faith. Then we are going to evangelize naturally, like as we're going through the grocery store, we're going to say, "Hey, don't forget about Jesus," or you know, I, so, I don't know. I mean, it seems like that is, you know, we're, it, faith is seem to be uh, the same thing, you know. But he says it is neither good actions nor faith in Christ that leads a Christian home. That's like asking which blade of a scissors is more necessary. It is both. This plainness, this mereness of this theology, uh, and it goes on, but. I do believe in faith alone. I, I agree with that absolutely. But um, it seems natural that if you have faith in the Lord, that works will just naturally follow. You know, well, and works is the result me, of salvation. Let me let me let me say this here because I don't want to get side, I don't want to get sidetracked with this. But but brother, and I don't want to offend you. Uh, so I hope I don't hurt your feelings by saying oh, no. this. But but you got saved four months ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, You've got to be very, very careful trying to um, prove points, uh, prove any kind of doctrines based upon this little experience that you have. Uh, there's a uh, saying, uh, they have zeal without knowledge. And uh, zeal is wonderful. Um, uh, it, it, it means that you're really enthusiastic. But I've seen so many people, particularly in all my street preaching, young people going out there wanting to preach about Jesus, but they haven't studied enough yet, and they go out there with all kinds of errors. All I'm going to say about your premise that faith alone saves you, but if you have really have faith, saving faith, you're going to have works that will naturally follow. Uh, I've made almost 200 videos refuting that very point uh, because... Um, it's not universal. Uh, not every Christian is identical. Some people get saved and they grow greatly and they grow quickly. Other people never grow, never do anything, and we better not dare challenge their Christianity just because the works that, that you see in their life don't measure up to what you think. So uh, if, if, if that's the way you feel now, I hope that gradually you watch more of these videos and learn that we don't want to judge other people's salvation because we don't see this these works naturally coming forth from them. Okay, Brother, Sister Eve? Yeah, and I also wanted to say um, to that is the other reason why you don't want to do that is because in Scripture people also get this, uh, get this wrong because they'll look at the word works and they automatically think it's outward because it, Scripture actually proves that mankind thinks that way. They look outwardly for works when Christ uh, does the work within. So even though uh, the work is being done within and, and it's a spiritual work that Christ is doing within the person, it may not be reflected outwardly. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you, you can't base it on that. Okay, Brother Joseph. Uh, I just want to uh, just throw in a, a quick uh, uh, point of view from a lot of Christians believe in faith only and, and are saved by the grace of God but because of uh, their teaching and, and ill-considered uh, interpretation of Scripture they often believe that uh, without faith or without works faith is dead and that's not to say that they're not saved it's to say that they may have a, a misunderstanding and that's not the case with C.S. Lewis if you read his works in, in total you'll find that he's very much uh, a believer in uh, in what we are, uh, what Brother Luke was saying here. Right, but, right. Uh, it's very easy to, to misunderstand, and it's also very easy to lose uh, uh, balance in this yeah. issue. Uh, what I, the only thing I want to say at, at the risk of offending you is stay very humble because four months of being saved uh, is, is um, you couldn't possibly acquire enough solid doctrine and knowledge to back up what you're saying yet. So, um, you know, G James said, uh, hey, brother, I'm quoting James now. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> James, James, James said, uh, be uh, uh, quick to listen, 
slow to speak and slow to anger. So uh, especially when we're new in the faith, we need to spend a lot more time studying and listening instead of trying to teach doctrines because it's so easy to be wrong. Uh, uh, I was fortunate in that when I got saved, one of the first things I did was I, I found this man on the radio named Walt, Walter Martin, the Bible Answer Man. And uh, that was 28 years ago. And listening to him on the radio for years and buying all his audio tapes and books, uh, I, I learned doctrine that over the years has te uh, passed the test of time in my study, where e everything he taught, uh, basically, uh, I, I still hold true to all those things. So. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to uh, find someone who can teach you the, the, the things that they've learned over many years, like Walter Martin was able to teach me, then uh, it, you can learn a lot pretty, pretty quickly. But, but most Christians don't study enough, and then they just kind of get blown around in the wind. Whatever they hear, they think they either accept. One thing I like about Sister Tanya is that she's always like questioning things and wanting to dig into it a little bit. Uh, who else raised their hand? I just saw a hand I, go up. I will. Uh, I'll go after anybody that wanted to go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Austin. Could I just clarify something real quick? I, I actually, I, I actually really wasn't trying to prove anything, though. Just to be honest, I'm, I'm trying to share and learn here too, and, um, and I'm, I just wanted to make sure that before. That's why I prefaced it, but just to say, you know, I, I just started this book, and I just wanted it because it's important for me to be, um, for you guys that are have been doing this longer to. to you know, I, I take everything you guys say, and I and I listen to it, and uh, but also I do I do dig other places too, and and um, and I think it's important that I'm not trying to I have I have uh, no I don't come here to preach any doctrine or to change anyone's mind or anything, only to learn and share things that um, are coming to me, and I am very appreciative for all the uh, adjustments that people are making, and I and I take them very very uh, seriously and. Uh, Try to learn all that I can. I have a video titled. I have a video pretty much for everything now. I've, almost every issue that could possibly come up, I've been asked a question or had to make a video about it. And I have a video that addresses what you just said. We're saved by faith alone, but, and I said my video was titled "There's no if, ands, or buts. There's only a period." And uh, we have to also know. Just be keep in mind that let's not get so so lofty thinking that oh yeah we got works uh, works are coming from us that proves I'm really saved and you look at the other guy just like that Pharisee would point out well, I'm glad I'm not like those other people over there I fast uh, twice a week and I do this and I do that and Jesus said the other man is justified because he just said God have mercy on me a sinner so it's very easy to start getting full of ourselves thinking we're the ones that are having the, the, the real changes and uh, um, uh, it's really a mistake to try to judge other people's works and their self whether they're really saved or not. Another video I made is called "Truly Saved" with a question mark. All right, who else was going to say before we move on? Well, yeah. I, I was going to say Luke isn't uh, isn't the Bible answer man a partial preterist? Uh, well, the one now, the one now is not the original one. That you're talking okay. about Hank Hanegraaff. <laughs> Hank Hanegraaff. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about the original Bible Answer Man uh, who preceded Hank Hanegraaff. His name's Walter Martin, uh, and he was not. But that's another subject. And we already did your show, remember? Yeah. Yeah, we <laughs> gave you two full episodes. With you okay. Uh, and now I know Austin. He was holding back. You were going to say something, Austin? Right. It was to back up Brother Luke's uh, theory on the salvation being the same. Uh, I had some scriptures that I was going to chip into. Uh, verify that. Uh, this was go back to uh, Gen this is even in the book of Genesis and then I have just a few verses that tag along to this. Uh, Genesis 15 6 uh, stated uh, this is talking about Abraham and he believed in the Lord and his and he counted it to him for righteousness. So there's a faith alone verse and then uh, we have in Galatians 3 6 even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, another faith loan. Then I have uh, Romans 4:22 to 25, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, if it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. 
that's kind of like a reference. I think uh, Romans 4, 22, 25 is like a reference to everybody else that's looking for like a faith alone verse to go back in time. And as it says that Abraham's faith was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, if it was written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but for us also to show us that, you know, hey, it wasn't just to him. It wasn't just imputed to him, but it was also, also like a reference point. And then one more in uh, Romans 4, 3 to 4, 6. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justify the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David, King David, also describeth the blessedness of man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So it's always been faith alone, even in the Old Testament. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Okay. let's look at uh, another verse here, uh, talking about the Bible. Uh, uh, did we find Second Peter one three, or is that another First Peter I did before? Second Peter one three. Let's see what that says. You said Second Peter one three. Yeah. <clears throat> It says, according as he, his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and goodness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Okay. So he's given us all things that pertain, given it in terms of everything we need, need to know is in the scriptures. Uh, how about First John 5.13? Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Okay. So, in other words, what's written in the Scriptures is, is enough for us to know that we have eternal life. And as I go on from verse to verse, anybody who needs to elaborate further on these, let me know. I'm just trying to get through these to make this point that uh, we can trust in the scriptures. Yeah, Brother Chad, could someone just tell me what what is what is actually what are what are works? Works? You know, what does that what is it, what does that mean exactly? I don't. Does that so, mean you have to go? Works are like does the argument you have to go do something good or something for? Is that what people say? Oh, you got to do good stuff, or you got to donate, or something. You got to give your tith, or something. Is that what works are? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of which video I made that covers covers this. So, but pointly, point. Some people think works is just following the commandments, but uh, there's ten commandments, and then there's 613 total laws, uh, and those those were not even given to uh, to us. They were given to the Jews, uh, but works or you can actually ask yourself what are works and what is sin because works and sin would be the opposites I, I, I suspect uh, doing good works is uh, doing the right thing and sinning is doing the wrong thing now a lot of people want to make sin uh, like a real cut and dry thing like I didn't break any of the Ten Commandments so therefore I didn't sin the last 40 years yeah. well that's pretty uh, that's what you call Easy legalism, cheap grace. I mean, cheap, uh, cheap law. They water down the law so much that they can say, "Oh, you look how good I am. I don't sin anymore." But if they really want to know what sin is, and, and that means you are, sin is you're committing a bad act, according to God. It's something that God desires you not to do. Paul I'll, says, I'll, "Let me, let me." Go ahead, finish, you, finish. Ahead. I, I, I have something there. Okay, Paul. Paul says, "I know what I'm supposed." Uh, I'm not supposed to do it, and yet I do it. 
That's called a sin of commission. You committed a bad act that, you, that was wrong. Paul went on to say, I know what I'm not supposed uh, no, I know what I am supposed to do, and I fail to do it. That's a sin of omission. That's like right now, there's someone in your neighborhood that maybe you were, realized needed your help and you neglected to do it. So we all have sins of commission and sins of omission. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the one that Eve was alluding to earlier, and that's the sins of the mind and heart. Jesus said, You say, you know, talking about adultery, he says, if you've even lusted for someone, you've already committed adultery in your mind, in your thoughts, in your heart. If you, you, say, you say you're not a murderer, well, if you've ever hated someone, you have murderous thoughts, you've already committed it. So you see, when we, under, when we look at it that way, no one can pass this test of, of, of failing. And so works are doing the good things, and sin is the opposite. You're not doing the good things, or you're failing to do the good things. Okay? Does that answer your question? Now, Mitch, what were you going to say? I was going to I was going to look at this from the opposite direction here. A lot of people say sins are wrong by Moses and the Ten Commandments, maybe by the church and something you read. And and it is true that 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 God has has laid down laws and there's been laws ever since Adam that's put us in hell. But mainly, really, it's if you look at it, it's self. You see, when you look and self-examine yourself, you can see that you're imperfect, or you might make your own idea that you're good enough. Either way, it's, it, it's still reflecting on you and not on Christ. So what happens here is, here you have this idea that, well, I need to measure up. So what do you do? You start to reflect on your own inner self. You start to clean out those rooms inside your mind, everywhere where it might be impure, or everywhere where you might have a bad motive. And it starts to become this self-examination. And it all depends on the person, how obsessive they are with checking out themselves. But notice where your eyes are. Your eyes are on you. And now look at the name Yeshua. Does Yeshua, God save, have anything to do with you? So the answer here really isn't to the definition of sin, because it's already defined that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's defining sin by your standard. And then some people will stand in their own self-righteousness whitewashed walls, believing that they're more righteous than their fellow man, because they're looking at themselves, justifying themselves, and then putting you under their thumb. And this is basically the law of Satan. This is what Satan did. This is so different from the Antichrist. I mean, from the Christ. It's the Antichrist. Because the Christ took away everything that has to do with your ability to become righteous in God's sight. And the thing is, is that most people are thinking, well, then what do I do next? And what I would say to this is this, is that in order to do the righteous acts of God, first of all, you do need to just rest in Jesus Christ. And those works will follow, but they're not always outward and they're not always works. They're not works that you choose. You would have to look at the work of God in your own heart and just rest in Christ, and the rest doesn't even have to be asked. It'll all just follow. Amen. Brother Joseph, there's another four-minute video for you. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, listen, I, I, I rarely mention videos that I've made, but there's one that's directly related to this subject, and uh, it's a short video. It's called, What Child Dreams of Being Practical? And uh, for a Band-Aid for Chad, I want to say, you know, I spent uh, 30 years as a uh, Christian, and uh, I didn't get to the point you're at uh, until two years ago. Uh, you know, through uh, another brother on YouTube and, and Brother Luke, I, I learned uh, what I believed. I mean, I, I, I believe I was always saved, but I didn't understand uh, what you do right now regarding grace and, and the lack of works being essential for salvation. And so uh, there are a lot of people that, that are not where you're at already with this shortcut, with this teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I did want to mention, you know, when I was eight years old, I believed that uh, I came to a saving faith in Christ. But, you know, when I was eight years old, I didn't think in terms of work or works or judgment of other people. Uh, I just went about 
uh, telling the neighbors about the Lord and uh, being uh, silly uh, with uh, joy. Uh, I, I remember it, and I've been told by my parents uh, that's the way it was. And so I believe I was truly saved, but I just didn't have any any idea about works and other people's uh, issues. Uh, and I think that's where God wants us. Uh, the works that the Bible talks about are his works. You know, when we go out and do good things, it's because of the unction or the, or the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so... You know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to go out and build a barn for God. It's another thing just to go about your business and be impressed by the Lord to build a barn. One is righteous and one is not. Mm, good. Um, let me see. you all calling you next. Let me just say this quickly because we're talking so much about uh, Chad now. Um, Chad, you know, everybody's not aware of this, but I, I sent you a, a bunch of uh, scriptures. And what I've, the reason I sent you that is because these are probably like, I don't know, maybe there's a hundred scriptures altogether. Uh, I, these are probably the most important scriptures that I think you need to read over and over and over again. It's like uh, if you want to learn a golf swing, you have to repeat it over and over and over again, and then after what, it's just so ingrained. Yeah. If you want to learn a martial arts technique, you repeat it over and over again, and then it's just built into you and just it's reflexive. If you will read those scriptures I sent to you over yeah, and over started. and over again and meditate on those, then when you see other things that seem to not conform to these basic fundamentals, like all of a sudden like red flags are going to go off and you're going to say, wait, so that doesn't conform. I need it, it, Something's wrong here. And then you have to decide, is the Bible full of contradictions or are these other verses that seem to contradict these basic fundamentals, is there an answer for it? And that's what we're going to start this next Friday night on our show. It's going to be titled, uh, I asked everybody to contribute. I came up with this name uh, through uh, Sister Lisa helped me with this. Uh, the title is going to be, she said, make it probation versus salvation. Mm, because pro probation means that uh, you're, uh, you, you could be saved, but you're on probation. You better behave. Salvation means it's settled. You're done. You're saved. Don't worry about it. But I, I, I took her idea, and I'm going, because I want this to be more controversial, sometimes a title gets people's attention. And I know one thing that really pisses off a lot of the people is uh, using these big names here. So my, I'm going to have the title for the Friday night show, MacArthur, Piper, and Washer versus John, Peter, and Paul, Probation versus Salvation. Let's compare what John MacArthur, uh, John Piper, Paul Washer teach in their Lordship Salvation messages compared to what the Apostle John, Peter, and Paul said. And uh, so that's what we're going to be doing on the Friday night shows. And in that way, um, uh, let me see, I got this back on the screen. Okay, in, in that way, if you read those scriptures over and over again, and I, I have a series that we did a couple months ago, four parts, just like we're doing now, two hours long each, called Biblical Christianity. If you will go watch that from beginning to end, that's going to give you an understanding of biblical Christianity considering everything, everything. Uh, so now let's move on. Who, who was trying to talk? Was it Eve? Okay, go ahead, Eve. Well, I was just going to say uh, with what Mitch said, I agree completely. And as far as the law, the law was the schoolmaster that led to Christ. Um, so the, the law, it does point to us. And it points to us, I mean, it points to Christ, but it points, it, it allows us to see that we can't do it. And so it, that's why it points us to Christ, is because when we look at it and we try to measure ourselves up, we notice that we can't measure up. Um, so it, it brings us to the person who did, and that's Jesus. And a, as far as um, the whole, like, James works, uh, faith without works is dead, this is where people get confused and they say, well, see, you have to do works, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, and they don't realize that in Scripture so many times when work is referred to, it's referring to inward work of, of God. The very, um, the very fruits of the Spirit are produced by God, and that's a work done by Him, not by our, our, ourselves. And if you notice, the fruit of the Spirits are not deeds, they're characteristics. And those characteristics are found within. They're often expressed outwardly, but they don't have to be expressed outwardly. So mm -hmm. I, ju I just wanted to throw that throw that out there. 
I want to ask Brother Austin to say something because he's been quiet for a while. I know he's got a lot of thoughts bubbling up in his head. Right. Uh, I can. I, this is something that I've uh, come across lately. Uh, kind of with. I'm going to keep it to the subject with the word. Uh, a lot of people don't see it as the finishing authority. They like to see this new idea of listening to the spirits, or mm -hmm. in a way listening to how they interpret. Uh, to live. I think this is a grave error and they're only asking for trouble. I also know there's a group out there that I think they've been around on YouTube but they're kind of gaining in popularity called the Bible is the Mark of the Beast and they also push this idea of listening to the spirits, coping with uh, coping with your own ideas instead of how the word says it. It's a really crazy idea, but the sad thing is that it's really growing in numbers, and I think that uh, it's just something to keep aware of, because we already have so many attacks on the Bible as it is, to already to this new idea of saying we need to listen to the spirits, meditate on your own ideas, I think it's this, it's absinthe, and we need, we need to absolutely expose this heretical idea and show them that the Bible is necessary for growth and spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, very good point. Uh, uh, I, I've said this uh, in numerous places on my videos that uh, sola scriptura, uh, the scriptures is, is our sole source to go for theological truth. Anything outside of that, like C.S. Lewis writings or what, what Sin City Preacher says or anybody else, um, the, the, we, we should consider it, but we test it always against the scriptures. And, uh, and that's even these people who say, there's, you're right, brother, there's a lot of people that are tearing up Bibles and saying, the Bible doesn't apply, just listen to the Holy Spirit. The problem is what happens if you have two people who are saying opposite th things that they heard from the Holy Spirit. Well, which one heard the Holy Spirit? Or is it really the Holy Spirit? Is it a different spirit that's speaking to them? You've got to test the spirits by the scriptures. Okay. Um, right, amen. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to this one, this new point here, uh, and I think this would be the last one we'll do today for as far as uh, doctrines of Mormonism. And this, this is current teaching of Mormon Church. Some sins cannot be remitted by Christ's blood. Quote, Joseph Smith taught that there were certain sins so grievous that man may commit that they will place the transgressors beyond the power of the atonement of Christ. If these offenses are committed, then the blood of Christ will not cleanse them from their sins even though they repent. Therefore, their only hope is to have their own blood shed to atone as far as possible in their behalf. This is scriptural doctrine and is taught in all the standard works of the church. Uh, that's a quote from Doctrine of Salvation by Joseph F. Smith, Volume 1, page 135. Wow. What, what a spit in the face of Christ. It's exactly. That's a perfect expression. I've used that many times saying they're spitting in the face of Jesus on the cross when they say he is not sufficient. Mm-hmm. I could start it with two verses alone that would refute that. Uh, Matthew 12, 31 through 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. So that would already refute it unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, unbelief, shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And then mm -hmm. we have in Mark 3.28, Truly I say to you all, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, very good. How did you come up with those? The right off the top of your head? Uh, I remember the just usually when I hear a scripture, I, I keep a segment of it. And I plug it in my head. And then when I remember something that triggers one of those words, I just, I plug that in. And what that was, was all sins forgiven. I plugged that in and then I came up with those two. Oh, okay. Very okay. good. Can I, can I, can I comment on, on, on those, on those scriptures? Yes. Uh, 
the one here where, where it talks about all manner of sin will be forgiven, yet the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. I have to point out that blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is denial of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Spirit is what testifies of Christ. And this was in answer to uh, the Pharisees that called Christ a demon. Well, if you're calling Christ Satan, then how can he save you? So this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was basically taking Christ off the cross. And also to say that there's a sin that you could commit that could possibly get you out of the kingdom of the heaven, uh, get get you out of the kingdom of heaven. Well, if there's a sin that you can commit that you could do, you could do that. Well, then Satan would be able to trick you into making that sin, and would negate the cross. There, so there is no possible way to negate the cross. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother. Uh... I think Brother Mitch and I have a Vulcan mind meld going on. Our minds are connected. Some kind of a strand or a cord is connecting us. Because uh, when when Brother there, but all right. <laughs> when Brother Austin was reading that verse, I, I thought, oh no, it's a great verse, but it's a can of worms. <laughs> because now I have to make sure that Chad does not misunderstand this verse and think because this is a verse that can be taken out of context and uh, there's, there's a whole big controversy about some people purposely coming on making a video and, and saying uh, I'm committing blasphemy of the Holy Spirit you know like that but uh, brother Mitch is correct uh, so I, I, I knew it was going to be necessary to just to elaborate this since you brought this verse up there's two ways to look at this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit I, I, I think the way that Mitch explained it is correct they were Jesus performed all these miracles. These Pharisees said he didn't do the miracles through God. He did them through the devil. The devil's working through him. And Jesus said, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is working through me to do this. You're insulting the Holy Spirit in that way. Uh, so, uh, And then, the, obviously, in order to do that, if for a person to do it the way it's described in that chapter and verse, you would have to be able to transport your back self back in time. I witness Jesus doing the miracles and point the finger and say, "That's not from the Holy Spirit, Jesus. You're doing that through Beelzebub." And that's the that's what you'd have to do technically. Now the other way of looking at it is the way Brother Mitch said, and blasphemy the Holy Spirit is not believing the Holy Spirit's testimony about Jesus that you must put your faith in Him. No, absolutely, okay. I'm, I'm fully on board with the unbelief side of it because yeah. it's it, logically it's the only one you can be forgiven of because you never came to be forgiven. Yeah, the only thing you can't be forgiven is unbelief. That because all our sins are paid for, all that's required now is belief in Jesus as your Savior. The people in heaven and hell. All sin, all sorts of sins. But the one difference between the heaven and the hell people is in heaven they believed in Jesus, and in hell they didn't believe in Jesus. Okay? Right. Uh, one more is even the verse when they're, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. Uh, he's saying he never knew them, meaning they never fully believed. Even them, they were part of the unbelief crowd because they never fully put their trust in Christ alone. They always tried to add on to it. So that's another part is the usually the ones on the di on the the white throne of uh, judgment will be the ones that never put their faith in Christ. I mean, they done all the sins, but I think the number one thing that will get them is that they never put their faith entirely in the the savior, the the Christ. Okay, can we look at 1 John 1, 7 through 10? Whoever find whoever finds it first start reading it. Wait, can I comment? <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> Well, I was just going to say, um, Luke is right, because in order for them to even suggest that um, the working of Christ was done by a demon, was the fact that they didn't believe. They did not believe it was the Holy Spirit. They did not believe it was God. So disbelief is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So I, just, I just wanted to throw that in there. Amen. Well said. Someone have the verses? I'm sorry, did you say 1 John 7, 10? No, 1 John 1, 7 through 10. Oh, I don't John think there is a 1 John 7, so if there's a John 7. Yeah, John. hey, come on, you don't have to be like that, Mitch. 
It's like it's like saying, "What's the check, second chapter of Jude say?" <laughs> Is it he was uh, um, he came as a witness it's to bear witness hours. to the light, so that everyone might believe through him? Well, that's John one. No, oh, we, want, one seven. we want first I got John it. chapter oh, I got one. It. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the, truth, and the truth is not in us. Okay. So the the thing there is the person has to understand that they're a sinner, and they need their sins uh, forgiven through Jesus. But, and when you put your faith in Jesus, his blood does cleanses from all sin. So that, that really says right there, Joseph Smith's crazy. All sins are covered by the blood. Certain, Joseph Smith says, no, certain sins are not covered by the blood. Uh, I also want to say walking in the light means walking by grace, walking under the blood. When you walk under the light, you walk under the revelation of your salvation. Mm -hmm. Well, and Jesus is the light. So, but Tanya was, if Tanya was here, she'd tell you all about that. She made a whole series about Jesus in the light. <laughs> it's funny how we get interested in one particular thing, and we really want to delve into that in depth. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at Hebrews 9, uh, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay. Hmm. Uh, how, how about Hebrews 20, verse 24 through 28? If, if you said Hebrews 20, Brother Luke, I might, yeah, might have yeah. misunderstood. There is no Hebrews 20. Okay, I, on my notes I wrote down the wrong thing, so skip that one. No. <laughs> Where's the crow? I need to eat some crow. Uh, let, uh, let's go to uh, Romans 5, verse 8 and 9. Is there a five chapters in Romans? <laughs> Potentially. Yeah, it goes up to uh, 13, don't it? 13? Maybe I'm wrong. Romans 5? Yeah, verse 8 and 9. All right. I don't want to get in trouble because I have a little bit of uh, Greek in my translation, but I didn't write this. Uh, it's 9, 8, or 8, 9. So it is proof of God's own love for us that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. How much more can we be sure, therefore, that now that we have been justified by his death, we shall be saved through him, from the retribution of God. I think I'm looking for the word blood in there. Does anybody have a translation that has blood in it? Or is this, is this not a good verse for this? Uh, verse 9 is much more than being now justified by his blood. Okay. We shall be saved. See, that's the important thing. We're talking about his blood, uh, shed blood being sufficient payment for all of our sins, not just certain types of sins. And we want a verse that points that out. And in verse 9, read that again, Brother, Brother Joe. Um, it says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Okay. All right. So, well, that I think that pretty much satisfies. See, we're going to go on and on. As you, is anybody surprised at some of these uh, doctrines of Mormonism that are, we're exposing right now? Anybody surprised by this? Yeah, I am for one. Uh, I I haven't really 
studied Mormonism at all, and I've talked to a few Mormons, and like I said before, they really uh, kind of go below the radar. You don't understand what they believe until you agree with the little points and they work you into what they believe, I think. Yeah. Uh, I've often said to Roman Catholics and also uh, people from other uh, sects or denominations, I said, look, uh, I personally, uh, I, I don't care if you're wrong on a hundred of these other things. Uh, uh, like, like Roman Catholics believe transubstantiation, that the, the, the communion, the, the Eucharist, actually becomes the literal flesh of Jesus, and the wine becomes the literal blood of Jesus, okay? Now, I, I'm saying, well, this is crazy. It's, it's symbolic. Uh, but uh, it, that doesn't bother me so much because that is not the, the, that's not going to the dividing line between salvation or being lost. Uh, uh, if, if, to me, the, the Mormons and all the others, if they just would agree, get it right about who Jesus is, that he is our God and Savior, and for that matter, get it right who God is, because they believe in many gods. They believe that God used to be a man and he became a god, and there's millions and billions, unlimited number of gods all over the universe. So they need to understand who Jesus is, who God is, and then how we get saved through our faith in Jesus. Now, all these other things, we're going to be going through some crazy things that Mormons are taught. And you're going to be shocked by some of this. But those things are minor compared to these most important things. Who is Jesus and how do we get saved? So, so yeah, go ahead. Do they believe we can become gods like God the Father, they think we can become a God? No, not you, Joseph. You're not an LDS or LSD. I, I was going to say I'm having trouble just getting my HVAC certification. Hmm. I, I see that uh, Brother Chad's cloning himself over there. <laughs> I just got That's kicked right. off. What happened? Did I have two well, of me? You, sure. you, oh, look, you, you look a little schizophrenic there, Chad. I, 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 I think... <laughs> Oh, how did that happen? I don't. That, that, I, I got kicked off. I don't know what happened, and then. Well, that just shows you the the new uh, the new man and the old man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Okay, let me let me do this then. I'm going to make a note. We'll stop here. Uh, we'll go on with one of their other doctrines, and when we begin the next study. But this is how we'll proceed. We'll present a Mormon doctrine. We'll prove. We'll show exactly what they say, where they wrote it. And so that we're not making things up about them, and then we'll show in the Bible that it's not biblical at all. Okay, and we'll continue doing that, and then we'll move on to JWs and Roman Catholics and do the same thing. Uh, now, I'm going to give everybody a chance to say goodbye to the audience, make any closing statement, uh, and then when it's my turn, I'll say goodbye, and we'll end the broadcast. And we'll start with uh, Sister Eve. All right. Well. Again, thanks for having us uh, here, Luke, and uh, I really enjoy these Bible studies and stuff. Um, so I just want to tell the audience later. Okay, sister. Uh, her channel is Eve Whale. Please subscribe if you're watching this video, okay? Okay, Brother Chad. Uh, just till next time. That's about it. Okay, brother. Thanks for joining us. Brother Joseph. Well, I, I slightly resent the fact that you don't think I can become a god. Uh I, I think I think Chad had some omnipresence going there. He certainly is possible. <laughs> I, I, I really enjoy this. I don't know much about Mormonism, so this is kind of a hoot for me. It's kind of cool. Yeah, very good. And brother, I didn't I, I, I didn't say that you couldn't become a god because it's um, if if you bec would become a Mormon, a really really good Mormon, follow all their teachings, they think you could become a god of your own planet. Yeah, your own planet. Okay, brother Mitchell. Uh, I actually do have my HVAC certification. So I'm going to be a god of, of refrigeration, which would be rather cold. Uh, <laughs> you, you, have a, you have a pedestal anyway. You're on your way. Please don't exalt me. <laughs> I'm already exalted. I already have a big enough head of my own. Uh, what what was the what was the main premise that you were speaking about, Luke? I'm sorry. I was just asking you to say any, any closing remarks that you from. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. About better. the show today. Well, I would I would I would say that when we talk about man becoming like God Himself, you're just looking at the fruit of Satan. 
Mm -hmm. You're looking at the man building the Tower of Babel. Again, it's always, and that's what works salvation, that's what all these religions lead to. When you start to self-examine yourself, the first thing you do is you feel very low. But then you seem to be able to make yourself more righteous, and the more you climb that righteous ladder, the more you're able to step on other people. And the higher you go up the ladder, to hell. It's just the yeah. way that, that Satan made it. And yeah. so when you talk about talk about building your own righteousness and man making a utopia on earth, that's the exact fruit that most churches run to. Instead of being under the grace and being under Christ, knowing that it has nothing to do with you and being happy with that and rejoicing in it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Everybody say amen. 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 Okay, Brother Austin. Uh, yeah, I was just going to leave, uh, leave a quick reference verse today. It kind of goes back with uh, just uh, tying in on the salvation's always been the same. This is even in the book of James, uh, James 2.23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So I just wanted to say that uh, if you come across a what you think to be a contradiction or a book that's kind of hard to understand, I would say just to meditate on it, take a verse, meditate, meditate on it day and night, and you will come to the conclusion that there is no contradiction in the Word. It's just, I think it's a way that uh, for God to show us that there's always more meaning to something when we don't see it on the surface, that we should dig into it a little more, come across a word, tie in some old clues, and we'll, we will come and see the truth. But uh, Almighty God bless you all, and uh, have a good Sunday. Okay, brother. Thank you, Austin. I'm glad you are able to work it out and be here. Uh, there are several other people that uh, I talked to who really wanted to be here, but various technical problems or out of town or this or that. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to join us next time. Uh, I, I thought it was a great discussion, a lot of, a lot of good interaction, uh, a lot of good answers from, from all of you. Uh, but well, let me say this to the audience now that really the whole purpose of everything we do is to uh, uh, draw you to Jesus Christ, our Savior God. So if, if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus right now as your Savior, if you never put your faith in him, uh, I'm going to tell you how to do it now. It's really, really simple and easy. Uh, we're, not, we're not asking you to join a religion or become a religious person or perform, follow all kinds of religious rules. We're asking you to trust a person. This person is God himself. He became a man named Jesus. He died for our sins. Now the sin problem is solved. Now you can have a relationship with God. And he, he gives us eternal life as a free gift. He raised himself from the dead to prove that he does have power over life and death. He'll give you eternal life as a free gift if you put your faith completely in him. But you cannot divide your faith. Do not keep believing in your own ability. Reject that. Accept the fact that you are helpless and you're lost without him and you need him. Put all your faith completely in Jesus and he gives you eternal life. So if you, if you decide to do that, Please write a comment on this, and we'd love to just celebrate uh, if you do. Um, so the, uh, next Sunday, we'll continue on with this topic. Uh, this Friday night, we're starting a series on the Friday Night Fellowship Show, and the topic will be uh, MacArthur, Piper, and Washer versus uh, John, Peter, and Paul. <laughs> uh, we're going to look at the difference between uh, probation and salvation. So join us uh, Friday. The show starts at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, and the Sunday show is 2 p.m. Pacific. So panelists, uh, don't go anywhere. I'll, I'll end the show, and then we can all talk privately if you want to stay a little longer for that. Okay, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>